If you open your Bibles to Matthew 5, Dylan just read the Beatitudes, part of the Sermon on the Mount. If you were here last week, and by the way, we're passing out a sheet to help you if you want to follow along and uh, take notes, I'd encourage that. But last week we were talking about Jesus and John the Baptist coming to the earth and their message was, repent for what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so we talked about the kingdom of Jesus Christ and how it was so different from any other kingdom. He didn't ask his men to go fight and oppose enemies. He didn't say, take up your swords and your weapons, let's go defeat another nation and take over their country. He didn't say or do any of those things. And yet he said, I'm going to start my kingdom by getting everyone who wants to be in the kingdom to do what? Repent. So what kind of a kingdom is that? That was last week's sermon. If you'd like to hear the answer to that, you can go back and listen to that online. But today we're talking about the second part of that, and that is the Beatitudes, part of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is describing to us, here's what a citizen in my kingdom should be like. And so I call it the Beatitudes because it's not what you do only, it's also who you become. There are some people who have a job, and then there are other people whose job becomes who they are. School teachers are that way, aren't you? School teachers, you don't just teach school and go home and forget about it, do you? That becomes who you are. It obsesses you. Day and night, you think about your students and what good did I do and how did I help their lives improve. And so you take that with you. That's not a job. That's a profession from the standpoint of being who you want to be. So keep in mind these things that we're looking at here. And by the way, I'll give you a heads up. I'm going to only get through half of these today. Uh, So keep the sheet and in two weeks come back and we'll get the other half of the story. And I did that because I said I don't want to rush through these because they are fundamental. They're basic. They're what you and I should be. And so your job as a listener is to go through that list and check them off and say, I'm doing this or I am becoming this person. This is who I am. And if you find something where you're falling short, that's an opportunity for you to say, well, I need to work on this one. I need to make corrections because the Bible clearly says, examine yourselves whether you be what? In the faith. So you've got to look at that and see, am I that person? And the Apostle Paul, when he was being judged by the false teachers at Corinth, he said, it's a small thing for you to judge me. I am being judged by the Lord. And so that's why we're doing it, not so the elders can look at you, not so that the preacher can feel vindicated, but so that you can be the kind of person that Jesus Christ wanted you to be. So I try to picture this Sermon on the Mount. Here's a beautiful spring day and the birds are singing. The skies are blue with white fluffy clouds floating by. Jesus is on a grassy hill looking down over his audience as he proclaims this message to them by the seashore. If that's not what it was, then don't tell me because I that would my picture. But he begins to proclaim this sermon. I'd love to have heard it. But it begins with what we just said. They're not what you do, they are who you become. And it's not surprising that a kingdom that began with a cross should be full of other surprises as well. And so last week's lesson was on the kind of kingdom Jesus had. This lesson is on the kind of citizen we should be in his kingdom. And so keep in mind that a proper understanding of these beatitudes is important. And the word blessed, we know by now, means what? Happy. Blessed. Happy. Content. You'll be happy if you become the kind of person that God wants you to become. Well, on your list, you can see what it means to become a disciple. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. There's eight of them there. But if you'll notice in your list on the paper and on the board here, I put them in a different order. We want to look at these first four and then realize that poor in spirit, mournful, hunger and thirst after righteousness, and the pure in heart are all essential ingredients that we will become the last four. 
okay? So you can feel free to study these on your own, but they're all very interesting. And here's another thing you can do. Go home and have your wife or your husband read half of the Beatitude and see if you can fill in the blank. <laughs> Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? And then if you can answer all those, you're doing pretty good. With that in mind, let's start with the first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. But what that means is the sinful emptiness of absolute spiritual bankruptcy. Poor in spirit. Humility is another word we use often for this. And we sometimes tease and say, are you humble? And an honest answer is what? Well, I, I think I am, or I hope I am. Well, the kind of humility we're talking about here is the kind that stands before God and says, if I have to stand before God on my own, I have no chance whatsoever. There's no way that I can be what God wants me to be. So we're not talking about economic poverty, although a very poor man can be very proud. And a very rich man can be quite humble. Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man, and yet he cared about the body of Jesus enough to bury it. And uh, Zacchaeus, though he was a wee little man, was very wealthy and he was concerned about the kingdom of God. So the very first thing to become a citizen in God's kingdom is you have to be humble. You have to have that sense of emptiness that's caused by your own sinfulness, your own awareness of your sin. And that that feeling and that knowledge makes you compare yourself to God and say, there's no hope for me. And so that's what we're looking at. The tax collector in Luke chapter 18 that Jesus talked about where he compared the two prayers of the proud Pharisee and the poor tax collector who would not so much as even lift his eyes to heaven but smote his breast and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what Jesus is talking about. You ever felt that way? You know, here's a real problem in America because we're full of narcissistic people who have been taught, you can have everything your way. I'm okay, you're okay. You do your thing, I'll do my thing, and we'll all get along just fine. That works good in the world, perhaps, but it doesn't work good in the kingdom of Christ. Christ does not say you're okay. He came to die for your sins. He says you're a sinner. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us should say as this, publican did or this tax collector, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And if you don't feel that way, then there's no reason for you to go any further than this point right here. And you'd have to ask yourself, well, if I'm not humble enough to see my destitute condition before God, how would I go about becoming more aware of my condition before God? And the answer is read the Bible. Go back and read how God appeared to Israel on Mount Sinai and put yourself in that situation. Go and see how God in his anger and wrath destroyed the wicked Canaanites. How he told King Saul, utterly destroy the Amalekites, do not spare man, woman, or child. Why would a God of glory and perfection do something like that? Be Isaiah who saw the vision of God in his holy temple in the, in the vision. And he said, woe is me for I am an undone man of unclean lips and I dwell among a nation of unclean people. We need to see ourselves before God because one day we're going to stand before God just like that. And if we're unprepared, it's going to be a frightful day. And so that's why Jesus started out with this very first one. And again, you see in Luke chapter 5 and verse 8, when Jesus is trying to impress his disciples who will later become his apostles, Peter comes up to him and says, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. Well, Peter, what did Jesus do to you? All Jesus did for Peter was help him catch a large draught of fish or a large collection of fish in his net. They'd fished and fished and couldn't catch anything, and Jesus said, throw that net in again. He caught a whole lot of fish, and all Peter the fisherman could say is, depart from me, Lord, I'm sinful. But he felt that contrast between himself and God. And so as we apply it, let me read this description for you. We're talking about the sinful emptiness which compels people to plead for that which they do not deserve. 
and for that which they could never obtain on their own, but with which they cannot live without. And you don't think there are spiritual destitute people today. Why do you think so many people are committing suicide? They have no hope for themselves and they have no hope for this life and they don't think there's another one. And if you have that kind of spiritual destitution in your heart, you ought to turn to God. But it's so easy just to say, I give up. And so we have to be able to recognize that I can be strong and be full of sin and regret that fact. I can be strong in the Lord's kingdom because I need God. Not I want God, I need God and he can help me. Again, we have the prodigal son who, after living a life of wickedness and sinfulness, and now he's destitute financially and spiritually. And what does he say when he does what? Comes to himself. He rehearses what he's going to say to his father when he says, I'm going to go back home and maybe my father will accept me back in his house. And he said, I'm going to say this, Father, I have sinned before heaven and in your sight, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. You know, in our country, a lot of kids come back home and live with their parents, but they never come back with that attitude. Like, Mom and Dad, I need help. Give me all you've got. I'll give nothing in return because, after all, don't you owe that to me? But not this prodigal because he was poor in spirit. Father, I've sinned before heaven in your sight. I'm not worthy to be called your son, but make me a servant. Your servant's better off than I am. And the father welcomed him home graciously. Or how about this statement? When God appeared to a man in the Old Testament, he said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Who was he talking to? I read that to Emily this morning. She said, that's Gideon. I said, you're right. But notice what Gideon said to the Lord. You know, God said, go in this might of yours, and you'll save Israel from the Midianites. And here's what he said. Well, I thought you'd never call. I'm going to show them how to do it. That's not what he said, was it? He said, oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. You know how God chose him? Because of his humility. He didn't save Israel because he was powerful. He saved Israel because God was powerful through him. And we know that Gideon went, didn't he? He was successful. You see, that's what God wants. Someone who is empty of themselves, who says, I don't have the power, I don't have the ability, and God says, I know it, but I do, and I can sure use you if you'll just say yes. And so God desires to dwell with all of us like that. And keep in mind what Isaiah said, whenever you want to read about God, if you have a problem thinking about how God, how great God is, read the book of Isaiah, just in bits and pieces. It's one of the longest books of the Bible, and so it's neglected, but it has some of the most beautiful passages in that book. And God says, I dwell in the high and the holy place, and I dwell in eternity. But he also said, I dwell, listen to this, with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. So why is the church not popular in America today? We don't have very many humble people. We're full of ourselves. And we're taught that that not only is okay, but that's how it should be. Now again, ask yourself, are you a humble person? You say, well, now how would I be able to objectively look at that? I'll give you a couple of examples. If someone points out your flaw or your mistake or something you've done wrong, how do you react? You get mad? Defensive? Attack back and say, well, you're no better. Look at what you're doing. Blah, 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 blah. If that's you, then you're not a humble person. How many of you would take a demotion at work if it was for the good of the company. Somebody says, you have to do that as a Christian? I'm not saying you do, but would you? 
of just saying, well, I'm not taking a demotion. I've worked hard and I've put 25 years into this company and I'm going to, if they're not going to pay me and give me a raise, I quit. A humble person doesn't say that. You know why I know? Because Jesus said, for I am meek and what? Lowly in heart. What's another word for lowly? Humble. I'm lowly and humble in heart. And the Bible says, though he were rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That's a demotion for the good of the company. And he didn't complain about it. And it wasn't easy. And though he were a son, yet learned he obedience. Hebrews 5.8. And that's our king. And so why do you think Jesus started off with blessed are the poor in spirit? If you're not humble, nothing else is going to fit. And so if you've got to go home, start working on humility. It doesn't mean you go home and take a, a, a strap and start beating yourself, saying, I'm no good, I'm no good. That's not what humility is either. Humility says, I'm going to put the well-being of others ahead of myself because I'm big enough to let them be ahead. Suppose you deserve a promotion at work and someone who's less qualified and been there less time than you gets promoted instead of you because they know somebody who can promote them. Because haven't we all heard it's not what you know, it's who you know when it comes to job promotions? Would you take that well? If you're humble, the answer is yes. So you see there's a few examples there. And right off the bat, we can have bells ringing, ding, ding, ding. I've got a problem with humility. don't have enough of it. Well, Jesus is the one that warned us about that. So that's the first place to begin. The kingdom of Christ is a kingdom that requires humility. And when he picked his apostles, he picked 12 humble men. And I can prove that to you as I've done often before by one simple example they were with Jesus for three and a half years, and at the Last Supper, where they're all there, Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. Now, a proud, arrogant person says, it's him. It's him. It's somebody. It's not me. That's how we'd react. I, I, not me. Not me. No, no, no. Even Peter one time said, Lord, I'll go with you. I'll even die with you, but I will not betray you. So he, did, he lost his humility for a moment. But what they ever one said to a man is, is it I? Am I going to betray you, Lord? And that shows a great humility on their part that they didn't know themselves as well as Jesus did. And they were willing to say, maybe it's me. And wow, what a great attitude that is. And that's the one we should all come to every Bible class and sermon with. It's this sermon about me, because you know our favorite sermon, don't you? The one that goes over my head and hits the guy behind me right between the eyes. Boy, he sure needed that, preacher. You let him have it. I say, yeah, but how about you? What? I was here. <laughs> well, I agree. I've been in the audience before, and I've had a few of them. I've had to dodge like he's talking about me. I don't like it either, but I know I needed it. Go home and let my conscience pain for a while, but... Hopefully it made me a better person. Number two, blessed are those who mourn. Well, now we're, we're told that mourning is crying is not a good thing. I mean, the world says that tears do not bring happiness. You know what Jesus said? Happy are those who cry. So is the kingdom full of crybabies? Well, now hang on a minute. He didn't just say cry at the drop of a hat. He didn't say cry when the Hallmark movie was over. He said, blessed are those who mourn. And what he's talking about is mourning over their sins again. The humble man realizes he is spiritually destitute without God. There's nothing he can offer to God that will make his situation right. The man who mourns is the fellow who grieves about that. And it's a mourning by choice. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, godly sorrow leads to what? Repentance. But what did Jesus and John start the kingdom off with? Repent for the kingdom's coming. So godly sorrow leads to repentance. If you're not sorry, sorry for what you did, then what good is that for you to become a child of God? I'm proud of my sin. 
It made me who I am. I'm a stronger person because I can sin with the best of them. What? That's what the world says. But a true sinner says, oh, I cannot believe I've committed this great sin against God. And so Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verses 2 through 4 says, Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Tears have always taught us more about ourselves than laughter. Now, if you know me, you know that I like to laugh with the best of you, right? Somebody came up this morning and said, I had this guy, this boss, who was a corny fellow. I thought, why is he telling me that story? Scott Morell came up one day and he said, Wayne, I heard a corny joke and I thought of you. <laughs> I said, and I'm offended, Scott. He thought that was funny. So I like to laugh. I like to tell jokes. But sometimes I think it's like Abraham Lincoln in the midst of the Civil War when nations, the nation was divided and families were torn and brothers were shooting and killing brothers. Abraham Lincoln was in the White House telling jokes. And he said, Mr. President, why, how can you joke at a time like this? He said, if I did not tell jokes, he said, my heart would break. You ever think about the burden that man carried on his shoulders during the Civil War? And so sometimes humor is to kind of relieve the stress. But when you boil it all down, even though we'd rather go to a party and have food and fun and tell a few jokes and play a few games, you go to a funeral because you realize one day you'll be in that casket or in that urn and that you'll either be prepared or unprepared for that moment. Jesus said those who mourn their sinfulness are thinking about eternity. And that's why it's blessed happy for them to learn about themselves. And did you ever stop to think that when Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, that one of the signs of the coming of the kingdom was that God would send his son to heal the brokenhearted. And that he would there come there to comfort those who mourn. Well, the Bible says that's what it's all about. And I want you to read Nehemiah where he's trying to reconstruct a nation that has been destroyed. And Nehemiah is a great spiritual leader, but the book begins with him crying and grieving over the condition of his country. And listen to his very humble prayer. I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant which I pray to you now. Day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there. Don't you see a great faith and a great reverence for God, holy, awesome, mighty God? Look how wicked and sinful we are, and look what God has done to us. And then I think also of Lot in 2 Peter chapter 2, when he lived in the middle of Sodom and Gomorrah. And you remember why he went there? He went there because he viewed going to Sodom and Gomorrah as a job promotion. My, look at the land there, and look how beautiful the pastures are. And my servants and my cattle can just feed off of that and get fat. If they get fat and sassy, I can get rich. Uh, Abraham, I believe I'll take that area. Abraham says, you can have it. Because I'm going to trust in God and God will make me rich. And he did. So what happened to Lot? Well, he gained a lot and he lost his family. Lost his daughters who had married husbands. 
had two others go with him and lost his wife who turned into a pillar of salt. But I like what Peter said about Lot while he lived in Sodom and listen to these words. He said, God delivered righteous Lot who, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. What was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodomy. Homosexuality. Lot saw things you and I would only see today in America and be grieved about it and sickened over it. And every day he couldn't stand what he saw. And I ask you Christians a question. Do you feel that way still about that kind of sin? Or are you beginning to break down and say, well, now let's rethink this thing. Churches in this land are going to say, well, we're going to promote this because that's a different lifestyle. They're born that way, and that's how they are, so we need to be accepting of them. Lot wasn't accepting of them, and God said his righteous soul was oppressed by their filthy deeds day and night. Makes you wonder why he didn't move. And then when Israel became a nation that was going to be destroyed in Judah, You keep in mind what was said in Ezekiel chapter 19, or rather 9. When Ezekiel is saying, here's how God viewed the nation. It says in Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 3, Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub, where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen, who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within. To the others he said in my hearing, Go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, But do not come near anyone in whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. And then he said to them, Defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. And they went out and killed in the city. So it was while they were killing them, I was left alone. And I fell on my face and cried out, Oh, Lord God, will you destroy the remnant of Israel from pouring out your fury on Jerusalem? Did God put a mark on your forehead because you sigh and cry over the many abominations that are being done in this country? Did you sigh and cry over your own sinfulness? Did you realize that the world's had more an influence on you than you've had on them? That God's word doesn't mean what it's supposed to mean? You see why Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn over their sinfulness. For what? They shall be comforted. God solves the problem, but you have to let him. Jesus knew what it was like in Luke chapter 19 at the end of his earthly ministry when the nation rejected him as a whole. And as he drew near the city, he saw the city and Jesus wept over it, saying, if you had known even you, especially this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Christ's coming was the pinnacle of Israel's history, and they missed it. Are you grieved and mournful over the mess this world is in today? Does sin still grieve your soul? Or are you growing accustomed to it and thinking, well, it's not really all that bad? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. But you have to really mourn. Number three, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hunger in this passage means hungry for a right relationship with God. Now that follows, doesn't it? 
First of all, you're humble and you're willing to listen to God's instruction. You want to see yourself as God sees you. Then you grieve over your sinful condition and say, you know, I've sinned. I've, I've started taking on the world instead of the world taking on my godliness. And now I want to hunger and thirst after a right relationship with God. I want that more than anything, and that's what I really need. The word hunger here is the same word hunger used in the case of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. And he was hungry after 40 days in the wilderness without food. Now, how many of you guys have ever experienced 40 days of hunger? Nobody? (laughs) Me neither, so it's kind of hard to relate to that. But that's what Jesus is talking about. Not somebody who says, you know, I'd like a little taste of that. I've got a little poem I sometimes quote. It says, give me two dollars worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or make me love my neighbor, but just enough to equal a warm cup of milk and a snooze in the sunshine. I want comfort, not transformation. Jesus is not talking about that kind of person. Blessed are those who are starving to death for a right relationship with God, for they shall be filled. God wants to dwell with the humble, contrite, honest person. Spiritually speaking, most of America today looks like half-dead corpses who stubbornly refuse to acknowledge their own haunting emptiness as they try to feed themselves on the husk of things that will never fill them in their soul. Things like the internet, entertainment, Facebook, sports, music. You know, that's how we do it. It's like, I don't feel too good today, so let's go shopping. I don't feel too good today, so I'm going to post something on Facebook. I don't feel too good today, so... I need somebody to make me feel better. And we go to all these things. They're not wrong in and of themselves. Don't get me wrong. But they don't fulfill your soul's need. And so what Jesus is really saying is, Blessed are those who starve to death for spiritual food, for they shall be filled. And we see that in people in Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. David said, As the deer pants for the water, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And so again, we see in Psalm 63, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. You know, the psalmist is describing America where there's so little spiritualness out in the world that we're hungering and thirsting in our flesh and our body longs for spiritual food, for spiritual nourishment. We long for God. And listen to how he finishes this. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. That's what I'm trying to portray. The world and us as God sees us. Jesus is trying to build a kingdom. He says, these are the ingredients for those who are in my kingdom. And it's a beautiful picture, and yet it's quite one that involves plenty of destitution on our part. So the righteous seek a right relationship with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, Romans 5, 1 and 2 says. This righteousness is willing to have a transformed life, Romans chapter 6 and verse 8. The old man of sin is buried in the grave of baptism that we may rise to walk in a new life. God is determined not only to forgive us of our sins, but God also wants to transform our minds so that we don't have the love of sin, that we have a love of righteousness, that we want to dwell when this life is over in a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God, which is a city of righteousness. That's what the Bible says. And So sin puts in every one of us A God-shaped emptiness that only longing for God and finding Him can feel. Men seek to ease their pain with medication and carnal thrills, but none of them last. Money, pleasure, even worldly wisdom or worldly success 
are substitutes for that insatiable appetite that we have for God. And so Jesus says, if you'll simply seek for me, you shall be filled. And he wants us to be like him. Matthew 5 and verse 48. Blessed are those who are like God. And that's what we should strive to be. Galatians 5, 5 says, For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Ephesians 4, 24 tells us as Christians, Put on the new man who is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And God's Word provides the man of God with everything he needs, especially instruction in righteousness. And so Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 13, the end of this world's coming, you need to look for the coming of the new age, the new world, the new kingdom, the eternal kingdom. And he says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which, what? Righteousness dwells. Boy, God seems to be obsessed with righteousness. Yes, and so should we. A desperate hunger be right with God and truly right, not fake right. Well, the last one for this morning is, blessed are the pure in heart. And we miss this and sometimes we think, well, that means the person who thinks pure thoughts, and that's good. Not immoral, not wicked, not cheating, not lying, not trying to deceive people, not trying to be a hypocrite. And all of that's good and the word pure appears in the Bible that way, but in this text it means this. The pure in heart is the purity of single-minded devotion. Remember James said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So Jesus said, a true disciple of mine doesn't love me on Sunday and the devil on Friday and Saturday. You know, there's some people in some religions, they, they have Saturday mass so they can go out and get drunk Saturday night and get over the hangover on Sunday. That's not single-minded devotion. That's not pure in heart. J.B. Phillips' translation says, Blessed are the utterly sincere. And so purity here is pure, is pure devotion. And so let me illustrate what that means. In Matthew 6, 22 through 24, this pure in heart chooses one master. Jesus talked about that. He said, you can't serve two masters. You'll either love the one and hate the other. You'll cling to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. Choose this day whether you're going to serve God or man. That's really the choice we have to make, and we need to get with that program. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Purify your hands, you sinners, or cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. The pure in heart, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body. Paul said in Romans 8, 13, if you put to death the deeds of the body, you should live. The true vision of God is not granted to the shrewd, calculating man who plays dishonest games and tries to appear religious before men. That was the Pharisees. The true vision of God is not granted to the double-minded man who can never quite put both feet in the kingdom. No, blessed are the pure in heart, those who want to see God more than anything else. And they shall see God, Jesus said, not as the Jews on Sinai, but with a full understanding of what it means to have an intimate relationship with God. John 3 and verse 3. Verily I say unto you, unless you are born again, you shall not see the kingdom of God. John 14 and verse 9. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Why do you say shows the Father? Psalm 23, 3 and 4. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So that's the lesson for this morning, at least half of it. Colossians 3 says, If you really are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and on things of the earth. For your life is hidden with Christ in God when Christ, who is our life, appears. And you shall appear with him in glory. And so I hope that you will. There's a great paradox 
in these lessons. The paradox is this. The kingdom of God does not yield itself to the mighty, but to the humble. They patiently yield to God's will. They abandon their own rights for others. And so because of that, Jesus goes on to say in our next lesson, Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. And blessed are the persecuted. You see how the first four help you to become the next four. And so this morning, if you're not a child of God or you sin by the wayside and you need to make your life right with the Lord, this is your opportunity. And I hope some of us see in this lesson ourselves. I hope all of us do. And if we have things we need to correct, then start correcting them now because now you have time. One day you won't. So while you have time and opportunity, while the sun's still shining, and it is for right now, before the storm clouds of destruction and death and judgment come, make sure you're right with the Lord. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And to be saved, he puts you in the kingdom, but to be saved, you have to be transformed into the kind of person he describes here. So if you would be willing to yield your will to his will, humbly say, we have sinned, me and my father's house, And come to the Lord and repent of your sins and confess your faith in him and be baptized. And as we sing the song of invitation, we encourage you to bring Christ to your broken life.